uh, <laughs> pardon me if I repeat myself, but here we oh, are yeah. on the stairwell, second floor, uh, Norwood Space Center, uh, in the uh, beginning of winter of uh, our despair, 2020, almost over. And uh, we got tons of fun, tons of content. It's all rock and roll, pop culture, media, you name it. Hopefully we have it or we know where to find it. Well, uh, let's see it. Let, let's, let, let the people right. at home see where we're broadcasting Very from good. Go ahead, okay. I'll be right behind you. Very good. So this is the entryway. We've got uh, Joey Mars posters from the previous series in 1991 on Lansdowne Street. We've got blow-ups from the Cabot Theater when we did the retrospective of 1969, the 50th anniversary. We've got COVID, thank you, uh, frontline workers, wise potato chips, you know. So we've got things that are 100 years old and we've got things that are as fresh as yesterday. Uh, these he's, are some, he's literally not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a display that we did on WBCN, Charles Lacquadera, Dwayne Ingalls Glasscock, his famous alter ego. Uh, this is a Route 1 project that Chuck White, uh, who's uh, a co-collaborator uh, with me, uh, he went from uh, Key West, Florida to Fort Kent uh, in Maine and stopped in about uh, 15 different cities, examined the local music scene, media scene. He was doing it uh, under the auspices of uh, Music Drives Us, the Ernie Bach uh, Charitable Foundation, and uh, picked up artifacts along the way, and you know they're safely nestled here for forever. And how do you decide what's up here? Like, is this we like just change it out all the time. You know, we do displays, we do, uh, you know, obviously uh, 2020 has been kind of curtailed in terms of where we do exhibits, but you know, permanently I'm working uh, at the Verb Hotel uh, in the Fenway. Uh, right now there's a 1980s exhibit in the display cabinet. Uh, we're doing a 1990s one, but uh, every, every inch of wall space uh, <laughs> is covered with content. And uh, doing individual rooms at the Verb as well. Um, in the spring of 2021, we're going to be putting air streams in the parking lot, and those will be self-contained rooms as well. So I think some people think that we are currently in the room, but they haven't seen anything. No, this is the beginning. This is the this is, this is, uh, this the, is the beginning of the beginning. So <laughs> there is no beginning of the end. So it just goes on endlessly. So this is the content that I moved here about three years ago. It was 12 and a half tractor trailer loads, 237 uh, pallets with about 40 or 50 boxes on every pallet. And how many years? Uh, probably 40, 50 years of collecting f ever since I was a kid and enchanted with comic books and marbles and soda can uh, bottle caps and uh, you know uh, baseball cards everything that a kid wanted that a mother wanted to throw away <laughs> so <laughs> so you know i mean what ma what makes things nostalgic and collectible is you know everything that you had as a kid that uh, you know disappeared along the way so you try and buy back your childhood that's the first objective and then you move on from there and so this is uh, everything under the sun it's not just music and pop culture though i try to save and connect the dots to the real world, to politics, to sports, to space, to food. Uh, we've got about 75 different categories of content here. And, wow. you know, we can create a, you know, logical relationship between all these things one way or another. And uh, for the last couple of years, we've actually been opening boxes and setting up systems of retrieval so that, you know, things are hands-on available. That's really important. You don't want to have to and go through... This is a big wide lens so they can see all the many boxes Oh, great. You. Excellent. It looks like even the boxes are organized. Now. Yeah, well, they are. They are. If I did anything correctly along the way, I, I, as I acquired things, you know, 16 years at WBCN, 19 years at the Boston Phoenix and FNX, and I'd bring maybe two or three of those male plastic carriers home with new material every day, <laughs> day after day, year after year. And I didn't just put everything in a box. I separated things. So the t-shirts went in t-shirt boxes, the magazines went in a magazine box, the cassettes went in a, you know, and so on and so forth. No. So now when everything arrived here, uh, at least we could put the boxes because they were dated and the subject matter and the category was listed on the box. 
Amazing. So right, now so we're uh, now we're open. T-shirts going on. Yeah, we got a T-shirt book that uh, Brian Coleman, uh, the author of uh, and the creator of uh, Buy Me Boston Volume One and Volume Two. Uh, we're doing the dance here. <laughs> there it is. Right, That's cool. a nice waltz. Yeah. So anyhow, we'll all these shirts are going to be in a book, 150 T-shirts from the archives. That should be out in a couple months. Um, so let's see, let's see one, or uh, you want to? Sure. This is a, a example from Bob Dylan's uh, <laughs> a tour. Uh, Unbelievable. You know, the Rolling Thunder Review, uh, which uh, featured you know far oh more goodness. than just the people. You know, it was uh, Roger McGuinn and. Uh, Allen Ginsberg and uh, Joni Mitchell and you know just fantastic collection. You know it's a big show and Ginsberg didn't make the uh, you know. Yeah, the and he didn't didn't make the marquee cut. Yeah, but uh, wow. you know this was just recently released on uh, DVD, a compilation of that. But uh, this actually played at the Harvard Square uh, Theater. He also played, I think, at the Memorial Hall in Plymouth. So it was a real you know kind of intimate venue opportunity uh, went back to the mid 70s I think it was 75 well wow. but actually right over here just to kind of yeah. you know not to uh, you know to connect the dots I guess here's a photograph uh, from that Harvard Square uh, theater performance Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and you can see Bob with his war paint on and his uh, and his hat uh, and uh, you know his chameleon look um, but that's uh, uh, you know that clearly there's a linkage and this is totally unprepared Maybe. so I love the spontaneity that if you mention something uh, if I can't put my fingers on it immediately give me a day and give me a day and a dollar and I'll find it for so you so there's 75 categories but in a, in a sense like the records are the records you know yeah I mean, the records are the heart of this thing or what's the deal with that well I think in terms of just the, the quantification yeah. the numbers it's probably more than 100,000 albums in here uh, 12 inches, uh, that's not even counting the singles, the 45s. But what we've recently been doing is uh, really setting up retrieval systems and organizing. Clearly, the easiest thing to do is alphabetically, but there are also subcategories so that soundtracks are separate from original cast theater and spoken word is separate from comedy. Uh, to do all the hyphens of music would be difficult other than, say, classical, because you know you can have folk rock and you can have metal and you can have punk and you can have this and that but you know at the end of the day you know the easiest thing to do is just a b c d through z wow. so we're doing that right now that's what the stacks are here uh and uh it's coming along great you know on a good day you can do probably uh 750 to a thousand albums and you get blisters on your fingers but then you develop calluses so it's, it's all work. good it's, yeah. you think it's your favorite the thing you've always dreamed of doing and then you, you leave with calluses on your fingers yeah well it's a small punishment for the for the big reward okay. and uh you know we're getting there and then then it becomes very easy if you say that you want to see you know a certain uh you know british invasion band or you want to see a certain you know prestige or blue note jazz act we know where to find it and that's that's the thing that's important. You don't want to go through, you know, a hundred thousand albums. I mean, you break too many fingernails doing that. A lot that. of your stuff's white label, so it makes it even harder. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, well, th that's the great thing is that you know having access to these things, you know, being in the media, you know, and having an opportunity to get these kind of rare, you know, uh, not available to the public, uh, at least not until it reached the aftermarket. You know that. Uh, having you know Derek and the Domino's Layla album with the promo sticker from uh, uh, Atco Records or uh, Atlantic Records on the on the uh, front of the cover and then you pull the two discs out and they're white label so that makes it rare I've, I I don't sell things I'm I, I describe myself as the Roach Motel of collections everything checks in nothing checks out so let's see the income I see I see a, a you know the workroom over here yeah this is a this is a room that's you know, being worked on right now, uh, but you know, if you need the uh, Alice Cooper Billion Dollar Babies uh, promotional pillow from 1972, <laughs> we got it here. Hasn't lost any of its stuffing. Uh, Charles Lacadera used to be uh, uh, the anchor morning DJ on WBCN. Has entrusted me with uh, his oh, life's yeah, content. Yeah, yeah. His, hey, uh, welcome everybody. We are yeah. here for the. Uh, Buy Me Boston live event. I hope you are hearing us. I hope you are seeing us. 
Um, you know, it's been some not technical issues, but you know, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, well, the beauty is that a lot of the things that uh, Brian has used uh, for volume one and volume two of Buy Me Boston uh, are actually residing here in the archives. So, so let's let's just you know center us as to <laughs> where we don't know that. <laughs> well, it, well, they they were found once; they could be found again. They could. You know? It's I mean, it's true. Brian, so, yeah. Brian provides evidence that these things exist. You know <laughs> that it's not some mythical collection. Uh, hidden away uh, in the Norwood space. Island. I think it's interesting. I mean, so that's the thing. I, that's the first thing. There's a million books that could be done out of here. There's a t-shirt one coming up. Uh, but of all the things, it was advertisements. You know, you were here, you had kind of, you know, you were buried in publications. I mean, yeah. you could have been buried in anything. <laughs> that's true. Never, I could have never been. Yeah. Well, and still for been the record, he's, uh, Brian has already written two books on liner notes. So that was three uh, done. Um, Three-ish, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so just tell us, you know, why is that what, what you kind of pulled out of uh, here? I mean, I guess uh, I started to, as I started going through everything, I, first of all, the thing that, that as people who have been watching for a little while, you kind of realize it's easy to get overwhelmed in this place. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it was because that was some of the first things that you guys unearthed and started to put in an area that was you know, not kind of cordoned off where something might fall on your head and, and injure you uh, was the magazines and the newspapers. And it clearly wasn't anywhere. It was a, the smallest percentage because a lot of them are still boxed up. But um, just kind of looking at all, I was fascinated by a lot of these publications that were either uh, thriving or just starting when I wasn't even born. And so uh, knowing different things about Boston, I was just learning a lot, and I and I found that 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 a good way to either uh, bring a memory into existence that had maybe been sleeping for a while, or to actually, if it wasn't a memory because you never knew about it in the first place, that you would see an ad for a store, or a restaurant, or a band, and it would just instantly pique your curiosity, and you'd be like, "Wow, you know, I wonder what that was." The incredible gift that I have um, personally for this journey has been having David so I can just ask him. And uh, <laughs> I have a lot of, well, because a lot of times you can kind of guess and, you know, the worst thing you can do is go on Wikipedia and read someone's made up story about something. <laughs> um, but, you know, with Kate Bourne and with David Bieber and a lot of other amazing people I've met along the way, I could actually ask them firsthand, like, tell me about the arc, you know, which was kind of in between the original Boston Tea Party and when the Tea Party moved to Lansdowne Street. And so uh, that's one example out of hundreds of thousands. And so I started gravitating towards ads, also partially because uh, Jimmy B from uh, Dirty Old Boston does an amazing job. He uh, explores all these nooks and crannies of the city in ways that I couldn't even begin to um, because he's been here a lot longer than I have because he's a better historian than I am. But his is uh, photo based pretty much exclusively. And so I wouldn't there's tons of photos in here, too. But it was kind of like that is covered so well that there's no reason for me to even go anywhere near that. So right. I said maybe ads would be a good way. I myself have always been really interested in ads in a general sense. Well, we talked about it last time, but I know there's some some there's some overlap, but we got a pretty big audience here. So you know just ads. I mean I I, you know, I don't want to say what you're describing. I, I, I kind of love the reason that you do it. Well you know. ads to me, and I think David agrees and anyone who kind of pays attention to them it's kind of funny, like when we watch uh, TV, my wife and, and I are watching TV, as soon as the commercials come on, she just zones out. And I actually zone in and I like pay, I've always paid very close attention to the ads because ads are the purest way, except for just having a bullhorn or, uh, you know, being out in front of your store and trying to lure people in of what you want to say. If you get a press article that's kind of mediated by the, the journalist or whoever's covering it. So it's kind of how they want to cover it. But when you do an ad and you pay for it, you say exactly what you want to say. And so that to me is, is really why it's very interesting to kind of talk about ads because they can be, there's the two poles of, of an ad are super creative, 
um, provocative, evocative, sometimes to the point where they almost obscure what you're trying to say. And then on the other end are super boring of here's the show or we're open now and we're open nine to five and come down and here's a picture of the outside of the store or something. Right. So, and, and then literally everything in between. And that's kind of what the Buy Me Boston books are about is different ways that people, uh, business people, small business people express themselves and try and talk to their consumers, both to lure them in the first time or to continue talking to them. And what I've always said is, the ones, anyone in, in any one of my books who's still around today is doing something really, really right because it is so hard to stay <laughs> in business for a year. And if you are, you know, Legal Seafoods or I have ads from very early on with Legal Seafoods when they were just a small mom and pop in Inman Square, Newbury Comics, and, and a lot of these places that have survived incredibly rough seas uh, to kind of still be vibrant, um, and then at the same time to kind of lament. Do you have a legal seafood ad uh, you could show us? Uh, I do. I'm, uh, the whole point is, I didn't mean to put him on the spot, but I meant <laughs> That's what I'm here for. But he does it. He's uh, able to retrieve uh, in this content. Time, you know, Dave, we have you here, and you, you worked at you know, different kinds of media uh, getting the ads. Can you just, like, what did that mean? Well, it was so, also sometimes I was generating ads. Generating well, so, them, making you know, them. So, but people don't realize now, like, and it was like, you, well, know, you have a business, you have this idea, but it has a lot to do. Well, it was also a process because, you know, it was a, I started out, you know, in the 1970s, and it was pre-internet, pre-computer. If you wanted to set type, you know, have some kind of fancy look to your ad, right. you had to actually buy sheets of uh, letters and then, you know, press them onto a page, you know, that you had to create borders from uh, little rolls of tape, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know, there was a, it, it wasn't a quick turnaround by any means. And oftentimes you could create the best ad and something could get lost en route to the printer. Uh, a price might fall off <laughs> and an album, a record album, for example, that maybe was selling for four ninety eight showed up as selling for 98 cents, you know, because <laughs> through no fault of anyone, it was just, you know, the, 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 the travel, uh, well, you know. Aerosmith would be a great example, right? Sure. Of how these things happen. True. But um, so here's, I pulled this one up. I see you can see it right on the screen there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this was from November 27th, 1969. And this is a very early, I don't know exactly when legal seafoods. I mean, I have early ones even from, in volume one from 74 where they were still young but this was when they were very very I mean, well, they, they, were, they were so primitive back then i mean it was like picnic tables and communal seating you know and yeah. uh, i think that y y you would go in you actually would have lunch or dinner with people you didn't even know and it was you know they they kind of had a little bit of an identity with this kind of red and white checkerboard, you know, tablecloths. Yeah. But uh, it was right there in uh, Inman Square and uh, that that launched an empire. So um, what do we not get, you know, before we go into what we do have, what are we missing in ads? And I know you have a couple, some videos and other things to fill in the gaps. But what are we seeing represented, you know, companies that have the money to place them? Um, and also just give us a uh, run through of uh, some of the publications that, that these were plugged in. Yeah, I mean, on purpose, the one, the other thing that, that I have, it, not exclusively, but I would say to the point where it's like 99%, they're from independent publications. It's not from the Globe or the Herald. Um, not because I hate the Globe or the Herald. I am an ex-Herald writer, as, uh, as are me, other people in this room. He gave me his gig when he was done with it. <laughs> Um, but uh, it, it, there's a barrier to entry to the Globe or the Herald that right. um, my main interest is always the, the mom and pops. The, my favorite, the best way to get the ultimate mom and pop ads are actually um, like local, like awards banquets uh, programs, because uh, then that's about as cheap of a barrier of entry as you can get. For are like, those common as like as collectors? Are those things you see all the time? They're or hard. Like, as, they're hard to sell. Oh, they come and go. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like uh, if you miss the moment, then uh, you know <laughs> they're not for sale. Back, back paddling is pretty difficult. Yeah, uh, 
but David has a ton. Kate Bourne had some really incredible ones, things like the Celebrity Awards and Designers Display Competition back in the early 80s. And um, those are incredible. I mean, visually, those ads are not exactly what I would call stunning. They're about as basic as possible because it was just like, and usually they're like, the whatever market in Dorchester congratulates the winners of yeah, the, you know, yeah. that kind of a congratulatory. I mean, yeah, those kinds of ads were you know, kind of put uh, into the publication uh, with probably the words and uh, a little bit of a vague graphic design was conveyed by the advertiser. But, you know, part of the package price was that there would be somebody uh, who was just doing the design work and cranking it out on the assembly line, preparing it, you know, yeah. because, you know, these small advertisers didn't have an art department. They didn't have a graphic dedicated person to create these ads. They just knew they wanted to support whatever, uh, you know, program this was going. But, but in a lot of a lot of times, like places, that's almost the only place that certain mom and pop stores ever advertised at all. Yeah. Like they wouldn't even advertise in the, you know, the Dorchester Argus Citizen or, or something like yeah. that. That was too high of a barrier of entry. So um, so that's kind of the, the two sides of the, the Boston Globe is one end of the spectrum and some of the like, I mean, a flyer obviously is different. A flyer is an advertisement, clearly. Um, and, there, and for the record, there are flyers lots, in the book? Flyers, posters. Um, I consider those ads, but they're not ads in a publication, but they're still advertisements, obviously, of, of an event or, or a band or something. So we just kind of jumped in. Can you, you want to just give us like a, uh, I'll put it on people, give, give a quick tour of, uh, you know, some ads in, in the book and then we'll, we'll yeah. take it from somewhere. Maybe, I got the uh, whole book do, right here. Do yeah. some, uh, What's so yeah, this will just kind of give you an idea about um, how things are laid out. Uh, so these are two different ads. One of these is for the People's Yellow Pages, which was a pretty incredible uh, organization called Vocations for Social Change out of Cambridge in the early uh, 70s, put out these kind of community countercultural resource guides. Um, on the right is Bob the Chef's uh, a calendar from 1977, which was found right here. I can almost point to where I found that just on a random top of a pile. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, that's, but, another, that's another category of uh, items yeah, that we calendars. have here. That you could find uh, a couple hundred calendars if you want, yep. you know, probably representing just about any year that anyone was born in. But I mean, if you think about it, a calendar is almost the best ad you can have because this would have sat in your kitchen all year round. Right. And this would have been on your refrigerator or on the wall in the kitchen. So honestly, that's about the best advertising you can get. Right. Um, so these are on the left is actually a flyer uh, to see uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Cambridge. Uh, at a small Baptist church in 1960. Uh, on the right was an actual ad placed a rarity in the Boston Globe for me, um, which you know was pretty incredible. Harry Belafonte, uh, Sidney Poitier is at the Boston Garden. And then basically uh, MLK Jr. was the opening act <laughs> to warm up the, uh, the talents of the night. Unbelievable. <laughs> It's always fascinating on those kinds of ads too when you see what the ticket prices were. Yeah, that, you know to see uh, seven fifty for front row. Seven fifty cents. You know, it's like now when I talk about some of the uh, concerts, you know, things that happened at the Boston Tea Party that you know the the admission price was two fifty and three fifty to see Led Zeppelin or the Who uh, or the Allman Brothers opening for the Velvet Underground. And when I mentioned two fifty or three fifty, I have to remind people there's a decimal point. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and not everything in the books and ad, for the most part, they are, but then I like to also really what, what the images in the book are meant to do is to pull at your heartstrings or, uh, or make you want to know more about something. So on the left, if you were around in that era, you know exactly what those are. David, you want to describe what there is on, on, the left of the screen. Well, those those were the uh, price tags at uh, Philemon's basement, where each week that went by, the price was cut in half, until I think ultimately, when 
it was a completely disappearing act with the price. I think the items were donated to charity. But uh, I, I remember, you know, with a great deal of pride, one of the uh, price tags that I found on a, uh, it was a rhinoceros album on Electra Records. And I think I wound up getting it for seven cents. <laughs> It was, it Wait, was, at Filings Basement? Yeah, it was that close to going to charity. But, you know, I, I kind of tracked it from week to week to week. Nobody Did you really? Wanted, you were yeah, waiting on it? I was waiting on it. But these, that was, you know, and, and, and the, ba you know, Filings Basement as a concept uh, later became, um, you know, uh, a kind of franchise that went elsewhere yeah. until it kind of flamed out as much retail has in you know, the last... 30 years, but uh, that was something that you just haunted the place looking for those bargains with the knowledge that there was going to be an automatic reduction and the price would go down, down, down. Well, let's put it that David haunted the place. Some people actually just went in to buy a sweater. <laughs> uh, some people were a little more obsessive about so it. Let's just Steve, say that. Steve so Steve's ice cream, a local success story, uh, started in Davis Square in 1973. Uh, eventually, I believe Steve sold the company in like 77, and then it became a lot more corporate. Uh, you know, they were Faneuil Hall, and they actually were a publicly traded company. And, uh, he went on to uh, kind of found Harold's Ice Cream, which still exists today in Northampton. There's still one. Right. I think I think one of Brian's quests is to find a print ad. Yeah, I've never found them. And, you know, this is a source of great frustration. It is. Brian. Oh, are those are patches? Those These are, patches. are the, yeah, which is, that's an ad so too. Anyone out there who has a Steve? Yeah, we got, we Steve, got Steve so, Harrell, if you're listening, uh, like, uh, hit me up. And I think, I think Steve's was actually, if not the first, one of the first uh, kind of creative and custom ice cream places. I mean, there were places like Howard Johnson's with 28 Flavors. Yep. And, Baskin Robbins and so forth, but Steve's was the kind of, you know, uh, adding the ingredients together that seemed unlikely. Mixing, yeah, yeah. It's an early cold stuff. So, so another like here on the on the left here is uh, this is something that's in uh, somewhere. I don't know if I'd even be able to find it again. But Chuck White, who is a deep affiliate here at the archives, part of uh, Mother Load, the founder of Mother Load, I think we're correct. Well. And, uh, Both of you yeah, guys are yeah. together he, in the motherland. He, he created the Boston Rock and Roll Museum. Yep. You know, I call him the vice president of logistics because he can find things. That's separate from this. No, he's here. No, no, no. The Boston Rock and Roll Museum. Well, actually, what happened was, um, you know, he was carting it around from place to place. It was at the Regent Theater That's and right. all over. And ultimately, he had uh, two kids. Uh, yeah. That's so in Dresniak. Yeah. And that, you know, up to the minute, Michael Greco, very esteemed uh, photographer who's based in Los Angeles, has a uh, book out right now. It just came out reviewing uh, Boston rock and roll in the late 70s through the mid 80s. And, you know, uh, it's published, I think, by Abrams. And it's very available. It's yeah. a great quality coffee table book devoted primarily to Boston music. And there's like a half page plus picture of Dresniak in their full glory in there. We were so surprised to open that book and find that picture. So <laughs> it's a surprise. So so like there these are is he has these uh like family albums basically of business cards. He used to book Bunratties and Green Street Station and just along the wow. way collected them. Oh so the and business card book coming uh and I always best, thought that was going to say left nut production. Um, <laughs> yep. That was Martin Martin Doyle Productions. Um but, you know, so the, uh, I interspersed maybe 10 throughout the book. I mean, business cards are ads, too, in their own way. I'm trying to find, there we go, Spags. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Chris would not remember Spags. No, David, did you ever shop at Spags? Uh, it was a little too much of a trip to go to, but uh, I did hear their ads, and uh, they, they, were, uh, <laughs> they were pretty famous. Well, so Spags is a good example of, uh, so I grew up in Acton, basically, in elementary school in the mid-'70s. And we went to Spags like that was a pilgrimage for our family. Um, it was cash only and it was kind of stuff that may or may not have fallen off the back of various trucks here and there. Um, it was all super cheap cash on the barrel head and they would have tons. They have stacks, but it was also kind of like Costco. It turned into building 19 and that yeah. 
whenever you showed up, it was just whatever was still there that day. And so um, kind of like the Finally's Basement thing. But so I would buy, we would buy like five pairs of Nike, uh, these canvas sneakers that I would just rip to shreds in about a week. But my parents were like, we're not going to pay a lot for these sneakers if you're just going to destroy them. So let's get, we're going to Spags on Saturday. And so I found these uh, uh, bumper stickers here and there. And I have, you know, friends, uh, my friend Terry Christopher, who grew up out, I don't know, right in Shrewsbury, but she was like, oh my God, Spags. So like, that's a perfect example of something that you either get it instantly or or you're intrigued. And that's that's the goal. Because like on the left, Earth Song was a just kind of a hippy dippy, new age kind of play. Um, that was at Charles Street Meeting House, very important venue um, over off off of Beacon Hill. Um, that was in 1970, and I, I know nothing about that. Talk but... about the illustrations a little bit. I mean, that's a good example of one that's really of the time, and also how you kind of incorporate some of those into. The yeah, I mean, you know, so that's part of it. Let's put it this way: if that if this flyer um, for this uh, theater production what didn't look like this, I wouldn't have included it because I, it, this means nothing to me personally um, because I was actually one year or four months old at the time, but also it wouldn't really say anything, but yes, this is perfect of that era of the kind of, you know, the, this is actually from the Lynn Lazar archives. Uh, she was part of the People's Yellow Pages, um, very uh, active anti-war uh, kind of protester, activist in Boston in the area. And so, so it meant, I knew this, that the fact that she kept this all these years, it, it meant something to her. I never got to meet her. I helped her family um, with her archives that are now at UMass Boston. Um, but I knew it was important to her. And so it was important to me to kind of, I'm assuming she knew the uh, the people here, Martha and Paul uh, Bosing, who, who wrote the play. And so, you know, so sometimes like... But I mean, when you go back to something like that, you can see that, you know, just like...